welcome friends for this monthly meeting of like minded travelers on a spiritual path i'm very happy to meet my co travelers our destination our true home where we belong this is not our true home we couldn't be having a true home where the life is so short in times of the cosmic time we hear every day this big bang took place 13 and a half billion years now new problems are coming even on the definition of a big bang all this while we thought the big bang was a creating unit singularity of the entire universe as we get better telescopes that go back into the past that go into 6 billion light years which means they look at what happened 6 billion years ago now they just getting into telescope that can look back into 9 billion light years very soon they'll have a telescope that will look back into 13 and a half billion light years which means they should be able to see the big bang every time the telescopes become better the universe becomes bigger not smaller if there was a big bang only for one universe and this is the only universe it should be smaller than smaller because it's an expanding universe if we reverse go reverse that's how they calculated the time how do they know the big bang took place 13 and a half billion years ago simple calculation of the rate of expansion if they know the rate of expansion they can go back rate of contraction it comes to zero in 13 and a half billion years ago telescopes are saying that's not true already they are started thinking what explanation will we give to the public and to the scientists if really after 13 and a half billion years ago we see is even bigger universe they will say there are many big bangs many universes and now they have a good excuse since they found a black hole a black hole is that in which everything is consumed in zero space zero time even time is also pulled in time and space are both pulled in into black hole so therefore the big bang is nothing but the explosion of a black black hole and if that is so the two black holes discovered already in our own galaxy and there must be billions of black holes in the entire universe if we go back 13 and a half billion years ago that means there are many universes even physically there are many universes so that is why science has a very big limitation it goes entirely by empirical data known to us at a particular time it's a very big limitation a bigger limitation is the scientist himself because he cannot think of anything other than what exists in time and space he cannot even imagine not not i would blame them because they use their mind and the mind cannot function except in time and space can you explain to me when i say i saw a beautiful mansion wonderful it was so great full of joy bliss but it was existing in zero space and zero time can anybody see it nobody can the mind explain it no does it exist yes why do i say yes you can go and see it too anybody can see now imagine that the possibility of having experience is much wider than the limitation exposed upon current data and the instrument we are using to explore it the mind the human mind has a very big limitation they don't even like to acknowledge it if you can say that there is a singularity a black hole that can push time and space into it what will exist any concept has anybody described it no scientist has described it so far nor the can they describe it because all description is based upon the given space and time exist when you want to discover what is beyond space and time no scientist has ever explained they want to confine themselves to the given this is it space time exists we let's see how far we can go how today they are getting into a lot of trouble they have already discovered 
that something can happen now, now, which exists in the past and the now and the future. They've discovered it. It's already existing. It's observable that the past, present and future are existing at the same time, accepted by physics today. They couldn't accept it 10 years ago. This new telescopes and microscopes are changing the basic concepts of science. And when every new information that comes can change your fundamental beliefs, how reliable is it? And yet, the truth is, we can go beyond the limitation of the mind. We are not the mind. We are the life force that has made the li our minds alive. We are the life force that makes the mind alive, the sensory systems alive, and the physical bodies alive, and makes the whole world alive. We are that source. Where is it? When we say we are that source, source can we call that source our true self? S with a capital S. The self. The self that Socrates says, know thyself, that self. Not the self of the body. This is temporary. Not the self of our self perceptions. They're temporary. Not even the self of the mind, which has to be used by the self in order to think. A thinking machine, if it's given to you, doesn't become the self, just because you're using it. The mind is nothing more than a thinking machine. It's an accessory to the self, because the self can go beyond the mind. If there was a limitation that our self cannot cross the mind, then there would be very little distinction between the mind and the self. But since the self can transcend the mind and experience itself without the mind, that is why it's not the mind. Now, I'm making these statements. What is the validity of these statements? The validity is that you can reach your own self, identify your own self beyond the mind through meditation. That's why I'm saying so. It's not my statement. If you make your own experiment, it will be your statement. Anybody, any human being that tries to go beyond the mind through meditation can make it. Now, then when we meditate, we realize a lot of new things. What is meditation, first of all? When I say we can meditate and do this, what is meditation? Meditation is to meditate upon something, to think about that, to put your attention on that. That's meditation. All the time we are meditating, we are all meditators. We meditate on our new jobs, we meditate on our families, we meditate on our friends, we meditate on books, we meditate on ideas, we meditate on something or the other all the time, because we think all the time. When we think, we meditate. Do we meditate on the self? That's the only thing. To find out what the self is, you have to meditate on the self. Not the body. Not the senses, not even thoughts, not even mind. The self that is using these things, the self that is making all these alive, the self that is creating the awareness that exists because of these things. How do we meditate on the self? The self is present all the time and we are aware of ourselves. Right now we are aware that we are in a human body. We are aware we have sense perceptions. We use our eyes, ears. Hands, nose, smell, everything. We have all five senses intact. And we are thinking. So we have our mind intact. And we can do all these things because we are alive. When we die, we don't know what dies. Because we never have experienced death and come back to tell our friends, we found something else. Some people have had what is called near-death experience. NDE, near death experience. A lot of people tell me about NDE, and I'd say, well, NDE, where is that NDE? No, near death experience. <laughs> In the United States, they love to abbreviate a lot of things. Somebody told me I'm holding an MRI. No, no, uh, IMR. <laughs> I thought it's a medical procedure. They said, no, it's your in in intensive meditation retreat we are talking of near-death experience has shown people whatever evidence has been collected 
And there is plenty, plenty of evidence of near-death experiences where people have seen their body die, the vital signs end, and they are watching, observing it from somewhere outside the body. A lot of experiences like that. The fact that they can observe their body from somewhere else, the physical body, which has the vital signs gone, pulse gone, heartbeat gone, probably brain is not dead. If the brain was dead, maybe you couldn't see even from there. That's the explanation given by medical science, that you are having this experience because other vital signs have gone, but you can still be revived because brain is not dead. And therefore, the activity of seeing from outside is the activity of your brain. Of course, it's a very interesting activity because you can see surgeons operating, declaring you dead. So if the brain can do that, it's amazing. Supposing the brain dies and you're still seeing your body, you can't come back and it doesn't become NDE. But it can become dying while living experience. If you can completely copy the whole experience, so far as seeing from outside is concerned, through a process called dying while living, this term has been used, but I haven't coined this abbreviation yet. But the dying while living has been referred to in our scriptures and old historic definitions of meditation even. In the Bible, Paul says, I die daily. And other scriptures say similar things that if you die before dying, you can discover the nature of death, what happens. Dying while living can give us a more accurate idea of what happens when we die physically. Because we copy what actually happens in death. I have seen a lot of people dying. At my age, my colleagues have died. Those who I worked with have died. Very few have survived into the 90s. I somehow have survived to be able to see many of them dying, terminal illnesses. I've sat with them while they are dying. I notice when they die, when a human being dies, some die very quickly, so we can't know what happened. Some die slowly. If you know the nature of death, you will notice that dying is a withdrawal of life, withdrawal of consciousness, withdrawal of your awareness from the body. It does not take place from any particular point except from the extremities of this body. If you watch carefully a person and dying, he first dies in his hands and feet. Doesn't know where the hands and feet are and says so. He's speaking to us and saying, will you put my leg on this side? The leg is already in that side. The awareness disappears of the legs, feet, hands, arms. And then the awareness disappears of the torso from the bottom. When that disappears, he feels he's floating. And floating, when it goes up, he's up in the air. It's only withdrawal of the awareness of his own body going on. When it goes all the way up, he can't speak anymore. We can see his eyes moving, trying to say something, and the lips won't say something, as if the withdrawal has gone there. When he withdraws there, the eyes are still, brain is dead, it's gone. This is, these are the signs that we can observe dying. Can we create these signs? just to see what happens. Yes, we can. That is called dying while living. How do we create it? Our awareness has a very useful part called attention. When we want to put our awareness on something, that means when we want to become aware of something, we use our attention. So attention is movable. Awareness is not. I am aware that I am here in this hall, but I can look this side, I can look this side, I can shift, I can look at my cup, you look at the beautiful flowers. I can put my attention wherever I like. That's a great gift to us, that in our awareness we have a certain part called attention, which we can place wherever we like. We have been using this attention all our life. Second feature of this attention is, it can be concentrated. 
at one point. Very beautiful. I want to think of the flowers again. I said, this is a beautiful color. And I look at this flower and put my attention on this to watch more carefully. I am getting less and less aware of you people. Therefore, concentration of attention does not merely increase my awareness of where I'm putting attention. It creates unawareness of what is outside of it. That's the key of dying while living. That you can put your attention where life ends actually in physical death, in the brain. Put your attention in the brain. That part of the brain from where consciousness originates. There are surgeons who have done brain surgeries. I've met many of them. In fact, when I was working for the government in India, a VIP, a very important personality came from overseas and got into a car accident and got into a coma, unconsciousness. We, because he was an important person, we didn't want him to die in the country. We said, we'll try to save him at all costs. We got the best specialists from all over the world. I knew brain surgeons came from Montreal, brain surgeons came from Vienna, they came from Austria, they came from all over. And we asked them to please see what causes coma, what is causing unconsciousness. And one leading surgeon told the chief minister of the state where we were treating him in hospital. He said, sir, we have tried to find for thousands of years what is consciousness and medical science has found it. We know consciousness is life. We don't know where it comes from. All we know is, because he had done more than a thousand brain surgeries, all we know is, if I put a laser beam at certain parts of the brain, I can disarm that part of the brain which is causing the optic area, man will not see. I put it in the hearing audio area, man will not hear. If I put it in the center, the area between the pineal gland and the pituitary body, where the medulla oblongata hangs, when we put laser there, the man becomes unconscious. So we know that that area has something to do with consciousness, but we don't know more than that. But he gave, gave a very revealing answer that when we want to put attention at the source of consciousness, which is creating life for us, we know the area. If we don't know the area, what is the approximate area? If we are really operating from there as living human beings in the physical wakeful state, we should be feeling we are operating from there. Don't we feel that we are not taking decisions from the hands? We are not thinking from the hand. We are think not thinking from the chest. We are not thinking from the ears. We are thinking from the head. If we close our eyes, say, where are we operating if we are a unit of consciousness? Simple question we can put to ourselves. If we are just consciousness, not a body at all, where do we operate from? And we we'll close our eyes and imagine it's somewhere behind the eyes in the head, not one side or the other. Behind the eyes, but not on the side, center. Center behind, not in the front, not on the back. We come to the very same area where the pineal gland and the pituitary body lie. It does not require medical examination for that. We know it. When we are awake, we are all operating from there. Can we then try an experiment of putting our attention on that point? Can we put our attention on that point and concentrate it? What will happen? You can try it. I have tried it. Many others have tried it. Gradually, you will not know where your hands and feet are. Then you won't know where your legs and arms are. Then you won't know where the bottom of your trouser, torso is. You won't know where your heart is. You feel you are floating up in the air. You'll feel you don't know if you have a body. And you are still there. In what form are you there? If you actually do this, and that is meditating upon the self. If you meditate upon the self as you recognize it as a unit of consciousness operating in the head, behind the eyes, and you become unaware of yourself, 
What awareness is left? Do you go into a void and not know anything? Or do you find that you can do certain things? Even while you are trying to do this, you will find you can still see things which you are imagining. Seeing is still there. Eyes are closed. Where, where are you, which eyes are seeing? Which eyes are seeing when you are meditating on yourself and pictures, memories, they are all coming and you are seeing them. Can you touch them? You can try to touch them too. And these hands are not even being used. You can do anything. I do these experiments and say, imagine the flowers, people smell the flowers, people touch the flowers, people can do everything. Imagination contains all the five senses intact. Now, if you are using an imagination to imagine you are there, you become unaware of the body, what happens? You open up another self of yours with all the five senses not only intact, but sharpened to the highest level. Supposing you're old like you go close to my age and using glasses and can't see, meditate, you can read a newspaper in your imagination with better than 20-20 vision. What happens? How can imagination have a better vision than the outside eyes? And there's a reason for that. A very beautiful reason. These eyes are seeing with the physical organ of the eyes because the inner eyes can see without glasses. The vision is not coming from the body. Vision is coming from there. If you are unconscious, the eyes don't see, even if they are open. Consciousness is required for everything to function on the body. As you will notice, consciousness is required even for the inner senses to operate. Consciousness, life force is behind all this. But the fact that you can discover that you exist, how long can you stay in that state? It depends how long you are meditating on the self. Supposing you can do sufficiently long meditation and regularly, because you are living in this physical body, you are just doing an experiment. During an experiment, do you actually die? Not at all. Heart keeps beating, vital forces keep going, which is not what happens in actual death. The vital signs go away. Here, you are getting the experience of withdrawing from the body and having a separate set of sense perceptions that are still working without losing any of your vital signs. That is called dying while living. That's why it's called dying. You are still living fully in the body and not aware of the body, aware of something inside. This is a very simple exercise. People say it's very difficult. So I ask them, why do you find it difficult when it's simply a matter of putting your attention like you put attention elsewhere? I found out the secret why it is difficult. It is difficult because we are used to focusing attention on things. We are not used to putting attention on the self which involves withdrawal of attention to yourself. Huge difference between focusing attention and withdrawing attention. And we don't know how to withdraw attention. We still try to focus attention. We try to find a spot and say, there is the third eye center. That's where I want to focus. There's myself. And we try to focus on that. Don't we realize that the one trying to focus is yourself, not what you're focusing on. You're creating an objective self of yourself. It's still focusing. People are so used to focusing attention. They have made the whole meditation and exercise in focusing attention. It is not exercise of a drawing at, at all. That is why it's become so difficult. Withdrawal of attention is very different from focusing attention on anything. Every time you try to focus attention, you move away from the self, no matter what. It doesn't matter if you close your eyes and say, there I am sitting and looking at yourself. If you are looking at yourself, how can that be yourself? You are the one looking at it, not the one you are looked at, what you are looking at. That is why we have made meditation very difficult, although it's the simplest of things, just because we have learnt all our life, from childhood till now, how to focus attention on things, never learned how to withdraw it. But is withdrawal of attention difficult if we learn it? Not at all. It's even easier than focusing attention. How do we withdraw attention? We just meditate upon 
our self where we are we don't say we let us see where we are when you start to see yourself you remove yourself when you want to know where are where am i there's your self there and there is one another gift given to us which is even more powerful than the gift of concentration of attention and that is the power to imagine where you are now supposing we think this physical body is our self and we want to imagine we are sitting in that corner we can imagine it we are sitting here in the chairs but if we want to imagine we are standing there supposing we want to imagine no we are sitting up on the ceiling imagination can take you you are sitting up on the ceiling you are not seeing anything you are feeling you are there the ceiling is around you you are there like you are here that is how we draw attention we say we are there by imagining we are there and not merely trying to see anything not trying to see anything just imagining we are there and when we imagine that we are there we are withdrawing attention to ourselves if one somebody find it difficult by practice one can learn it if you feel interested and want to know how to practice withdrawal of attention i can sit with you and do it that is where we call imr intensive meditation retreat that's what we do there how to withdraw attention to yourself supposing you are successful with sufficient time to give to withdrawal of attention as a means of meditation don't give it any title what kind of meditation is hatha yoga or this yoga or that yoga or surshab yoga or what religion you belong to or the teachings of religion are at this moment forget everything you are a human being with consciousness and a life you want to find out what the self is imagine the self imagine you are the self imagine where are you if you are not the body an easier way of doing it is think of the body as a house in which you live again imagination use imagination to say this body of mine is a house i live in and main part of the house is the torso hanging to it are accessories like arms and so on and these are not important we want to know what happens in the torso we if we discover through ordinary yoga which has been practiced for thousands of years called the yoga of the six energy centers when you practice yoga of the energy centers many of you might have done it i did it for quite a while in the energy centers you can focus your attention on the energy centers away from yourself to the, at the bottom of the body at the rectum at the genitals and the navel at the heart at the throat and back to the eyes you start from the eyes go down go down quickly along the spine and come back one by one when you go through this process of yoga of the six chakras six centers of energy you discover that each center of energy is performing a function if you consider this body as a house of yours in which you live those centers act like different floors of the body of the house you are right now awake sitting in front of me on the sixth floor of your house which is true here is the sixth floor this is the sixth chakra sixth center of energy right in the eyes it's been referred to as the two petal lotus in the literature where they describe the six centers they want to use the flower lotus flower to describe it two petal lotus simplest lotus two eyes two petal go to the start from the bottom go down along the spine the great elevator that exists on the back of the body it is an elevator spine is an elevator behind the body you go by the elevator and four petal lotus six petal lotus you will see the formation of those are very similar to the petals that they describe till you come to heart here back to two petal lotus now when you do that you get a feeling the body has six levels of experiences because if you concentrate attention on these centers you get different experiences at each center not only that the old patanjali yogis and other yogis yoga performing people are telling they are given different mantras different words to repeat to hold attention there 
So there are different levels. And now, if you're finding yourself, you don't have to go to these levels, except you're conscious of the fact that your house, built like a body, like the torso of a body, has six floors. You are on the sixth floor right now. You close your eyes, sixth floor, aware of the next floor, at the throat, the next floor, heart, or you, all the six floors are intact. You are aware of them. Then you are not the body when you think like that. You are sitting in the sixth floor of your house. Another imaginative exercise that helps you to concentrate your attention on the self. Now you make a nice floor here. Sixth floor should be well decorated. Because when you are awake, you are at sixth floor. When you sleep and have dreams, you are not there. Some people think that the consciousness always operates from the head. Consciousness operates from the head, from the third eye center, but the awareness of where you are shifts constantly. In meditation, when you pull your attention, it will shift inside. When you go to sleep, it shifts inside. Supposing tonight, when you are going to sleep, you want to check, am I still behind my eyes, which I was all day? How do you know you were behind the eyes? You could close your eyes and with your hand touch your eyes any time. Oh, like this, you know where the eyes are. Not a problem. You are constantly aware of where your eyes are. You don't have to look in the mirror to see where the eyes are. You know where they are, whether the eyes are open or closed. You can close your eyes and say, these are my eyes, I know where they are. Okay, when you are sleepy at night, try to touch the same eyes. Just when you are not fully asleep, but just feeling sleepy, try to touch the eyes. You will touch your nose and think you are touching your eyes. Try it out. What does, it, what does it mean? It means when you sleep and losing consciousness of your body, you are dropping your level of awareness of where your eyes are, where you are. You are actually dropping your notional point in the body. You are still operating from the head, but you think the eyes have dropped. The eyes themselves have dropped. When you are dreaming, you are right here. There were some yogic exercises, not easy, but some yogis do it, I practice for a little while, that they can retain some partial awareness of the body while doing meditation in the throat center. When you do that, the dream states, the vivid dreams come, lucid dreams come at the throat center, but you think the eyes are there. And if at that dream you want to touch the body, which you are partially aware of, you are touching your throat and thinking, I am touching my eyes. Why am I mentioning this is because it's a process of energy centers draw us down when we lose awareness in any other way than in meditation. And we all need to do it. We all need sleep. We go to sleep, we don't lower ourselves. Deep sleep can even go even further down. Otherwise, you have to do yogic practices to take it below the throat center. Now, I am only mentioning all this to remind you at this stage, in the wakeful state, the meditation I am suggesting cannot be done in sleep state, cannot be done in any other state except in the wakeful human state. Because here you have a choice, you can decide where to go. In dreams you have very little choice. Things just happen very fast. Here things are slow, you have got time to decide, okay, I am going to meditate, I am in my house, I am on the sixth floor, decorate it nicely. If you feel it's like a house with walls in it, put the best curtains, drapes. If you think it's a garden, plant more flowers. If you think it's a very expanded place, which it will become automatically, if you put your attention there, your awareness of the sides of the head will go away, the body's awareness will go away. It's what you are imagining will open up. When that opens up, the inner self, which has the same self, the same mind, the same sense perception that you have now, they are not anybody else's, they are yours. Begin to see something that looks imaginary, but is a reality of that level. It's very interesting that you can think it is imaginary exercise and then start remembering things in the mind, same mind. In that body, you can remember things which happened 
prior to your physical birth as if you were alive in that state even earlier what does that mean it won't be memory like past life regression somebody is telling your own memory i remember and then you realize you didn't even have the physical body the kind that you have now but you had the same sensory system that you had the same mind same mind same thoughts what does it mean a personal experience like that tells you that what you have reached had pre-existed your physical death physical birth and will continue to exist beyond your physical death you have reached a state of your own self a body that exists inside with the same sense perceptions we are using now with the same mind that is thinking now and pre-existed before the birth of our physical body and not anybody else's evidence is required your own personal experience you can recall several past lives in which you had the same sense perceptions and the same mind you can't go very far because you'll go back to the birth of that body also at the most if you have very sharp memory that all you can do maybe 1000 years back nobody said i was able to remember 50000 years ago nobody even by past life regression nobody has gone beyond 1000 years because the life of that inner self is between 1000 and 3000 physical years and we know it because you can go there and meet all other people of the same body same form it's not that you are alone it's a wide world a bigger world than this physical world with all its galaxy that we have found that world which we can see with sense perception without physical matter is a bigger world what is the difference between that body of sense perceptions and this body only one difference there is physical matter atoms in this body and it doesn't exist there the rest is the same same form same impression same perceptions of the body and of others except no physical matter now when that happens can you also see physical things or only you will see things like yourself as it happens there is an inner experience that is an overlap between that which is still physical and that which is totally non physical like your own body at that time we call it an overlap of the physical and the astral worlds why we call it astral is because there is a separate sky different skies open up and they have a different feature than our physical sky so we call that astral world and the astral body astral self astral refer to the sky what's the difference in that sky and this sky this sky is seen with the sun sun sets it dies dark sun rises the other side of the earth becomes night this becomes day when sun sets other side becomes day this becomes night our day and night creates a dark and lighted sky blue sky light sky cloudy sky therefore we are able to differentiate between night and day inner body will always have a gray sky which never becomes dark and there are no days and nights that's a very big difference and that is why it's appropriate to call it an astral sky a different one it is a twilight zone kind that will neither very bright nor very dark it's always there but that's not the only th- difference because of the nature of the sky one other major difference and that is that it is the light of this sun or artificially created light that we can with our eyes see things here suppose in this room were totally dark i would neither see you nor see the flowers nor would you see me that we are dependent upon outside light to use our own sense perception how dependent we are on something external to ourselves to use a perception that lies with us big limitation this limitation is removed from the inner eye the inner eye can see in what is apparently like darkness because the things we see have their own illumination everything seems to have its own illumination now i'll give you an example 
sit in a dark room. Black. Make sure you can't see anything with eyes open. Then close your eyes and cover them up with your hands or somewhere. So no chance of seeing from anything outside. And imagine you are seeing a bright light lit up. You'll see it lit up. How can you see it? The inner space which you create by imagination can create lights also. Not only does it create lights, everything you see will be lit up by itself, not because of there's any falling of light from outside. Very big difference. That is why sometimes they say it's a radiant stage. And people referring to their gurus or masters say, I want to see the radiant form of the master. Radiant form does not mean there's sparks coming out of him. Radiant form only means in utter darkness you can see him. Like we can see everything else in utter darkness inside. So that is why the big difference between the application of light in the physical world and the astral world. And imagine how easy it is for us to experience that while we are human beings and we have the capacity to concentrate our attention on our own self behind the eyes. The simplest thing that people talk about it, read about it, attend talks about it, attend lectures and don't do it. They try to do it, it's very hard. Why is it hard? If this is such a glorious opportunity we have to find that we exist in another form inside with a much longer life, it existed before our birth, will exist after our death. By seeing that we know death is not end of our life, we'll just live in a different form of body. If this is so simple, why don't we do it? And I tell you one thing, if you do it, you'll never be afraid of death after that day. That's a big thing. Most people are afraid of death. Here's the solution to that. You can remove the fear of death by a simple exercise of discovering who you are before you were born and what you will be after you die with the same mind, same sense perceptions as you have now. It's not a different being, it's the same being, an identical being. We're just having an extra material body on ourselves, that's all. This single step of discovering our astral self inside is a very big step in discovering that this is very temporary what we are holding. This is not the self. There is a self which lasts much longer inside. Very good experience and anybody can do it. This is not something you require even a master for that. This you just understand the point you can do it. If you understood my point today, you can try tonight and experiment with it. There will be somebody trying to stop you. Not from outside, from inside. Somebody will try to not let you concentrate your attention inside, making this exercise difficult. Who is that? Somebody inside you? Thoughts will come to make you remember things that are happening outside. They clap very fast. Thoughts which haven't come when we're doing our daily work will come when you try to meditate on your own self. Where are they coming from and why are they coming? Why are they interrupting your efforts to put your attention entirely on where you are by imagination? Why is a thought coming at that time where you left your keys, what you will do tomorrow? Who are you to meet today? Is somebody missing you? Did I leave the food on the kitchen? Why are these thoughts coming so much? when we are trying not to think of anything but our own self. Is somebody interfering? Yes. What is interfering is something in us that is threatened by this operation and wants to survive our own mind. It's a mind trying to survive. It doesn't want you to go in. Because mind is enjoying life outside. Mind has been used to Desiring everything outside, attaching itself to things outside. Desire and attachment has made the mind a slave of this attachment and wants to stay there, get the best out of this experience and has convinced us and itself 
This is the only life. There is nothing else. Body is the only body. Self. When you die, it all ends. Just have a good time. Let's enjoy. And now we are trying to do something to go the opposite direction. The mind says go out. We say go in. There is a conflict taking place. That's the second part which is making meditation on the self difficult. It's not that somebody is stopping you from outside. It's only inside our own mind. Now, when we think the mind is our own self, we can't do any meditation. We get tired thinking of all the other things. And we try to think of ourselves. Mind takes us and we get drawn into it. If nothing else works, if we say no thinking of anything else, mind pushes us down, go to sleep. Meditation is a good way to go to sleep. I have recommended to people who have insomnia, <laughs> try meditation. A very, very nice way. Look at how quickly tendency to, sometimes even listening to a talk which is not related to things outside, inside, makes us feel sleepy. Sleep is so so strong a power on us. I remember doing a meditation exercise many years ago in Bruce, Wisconsin. And I was tired, but I said, no, let's meditate, close our eyes. After some time, I felt I was snoring. <laughs> Most people cannot hear their snoring. Snoring takes place when they go below the area of remembering what you are doing in physical. Snoring is a good sign that you are really in deep sleep. But somehow for a long time I can hear my snoring. I know when I am getting to that sleep, I felt I was snoring. I opened my eyes, everybody was looking at me. <laughs> they were supposed to be closed eyes. But my snoring woke up everybody. So, and I was really, I felt asleep. I am trying to tell them to meditate and I myself have gone to sleep. But I tried to quickly, with my common sense, use that. This is a way of demonstrating how you go to sleep. <laughs> anyway, I am only mentioning to you very briefly the possibility that you can be there with these two obstacles in mind and they take time to control. And this obstacle of the mind delays our actual concentration of attention on the self a little more. But this is not the end of our journey. This is just, just the beginning of knowing that there is more in us than we think. Once we discover that, many people think that is soul. And they call it soul. People say, those who believe in transmigration, they say, my soul was in that body, now my soul has come in this body. Soul does not travel anywhere. Soul is not a traveler because soul is out of space and time. <coughs> travel requires space and time. Soul cannot travel, soul does not travel. It's the astral body that travels. And they call it soul. My soul has now come here. It's the astral body has moved. Because this body did not move, something else moved. And we call it soul. And many masters start thinking that is the end of our journey. And the heavens and... Heavens exist there, by the way, in the upper level. Not in the overlap. Heavens exist in the upper level, which you can transcend. The overlap can be transcended by meditation in the astral body. How do we meditate there? Same way, in the, behind the eyes of the astral self. Meditation after that becomes totally different. And I'll touch upon it briefly when I see you later in the afternoon. I'll touch upon what can happen beyond this experience and tell you that you can go beyond the mind. And I'll tell you how how to go beyond the mind and discover the true self, not bound by time and space, not bound by thinking, not bound by sense perceptions, not bound by matter at all. And that possibility exists in human beings. And I'll explain to you. After this lunch break, enjoy your lunch. I'll see you about 3 o'clock again.